to get started, let's do an opening exercise to get your uh, idea generation, agile thinking, juices flowing. And let, let's start with uh, this thought puzzle. Uh, two mothers and two daughters were fishing and they managed to catch one small fish, one regular sized fish and one large fish. Since there are only three fish caught, how is it possible that each woman caught her own fish? All right, here's a second one uh, for you. Uh, Marsha and Marjorie were born on the same day uh, to the same, uh, in the same month, uh, in the same year, to the same mother and father, uh, yet they're not twins. Uh, how is that possible? All right, you can put your answers in the, uh, in the chat box and respond that way. And I see lots of great, uh, I see lots of great ideas and guesses. Uh, but uh, the answer to the first one is that there's only three women. There is a, a daughter, a mother, and a grandmother, but uh, the mother is not only uh, the mother to the daughter, but also the daughter of the grandmother. So there's only three women, and therefore uh, each one is able to uh, catch uh, their own fish. And in the case of Marjorie, Marcia and Marjorie, how is it possible that they're born in the same day, the same month, the same year, same mother and father, and yet aren't twins? It is because they are triplets. So now that your idea generation juices are flowing, uh, let's uh, jump right in and talk about why it's important uh, to have idea generation to, in today's rapidly changing world. And first of all, I wanted to just kind of prove out to you what I think we all know anecdotally, and that is just how rapidly the world is changing. Uh, this is the number of websites by year. Uh, in 2005, there were 64 million websites worldwide. Uh, today, there's 1.7 billion websites. This is the uh, number of scientific journal articles uh, worldwide that are peer reviewed. In uh, 1970, there was less than uh, 260,000, and today there is approaching 4 million scientific journal articles that were peer reviewed and published uh, uh, last year. Uh, what about, um, you know, in the, if you think about it in the commercial world, uh, you know, how, how long does a company that's in the S&P 500, uh, which is 500 of the largest publicly traded companies, how long on average does it say in the S&P 500? Well, if you did that exercise in 1960, if you took a snapshot of the companies that were in the S&P uh, at that point in time and asked how long they'd been there, on average in 1960, they'd been there about 60 years. If you did that same snapshot today, you'd find out that they've been there about 17 years. In fact, it's very likely uh, that if you look at all the companies that are in the S&P 500, that one half of them will exit the S&P 500 in the next decade. I mean, this uh, chart just gives you some uh, reminders about those that have entered the index in the past decade, like Google and Netflix, um, and those who have left the index uh, in the past 10 years, like uh, Maytag or um, uh, Palm. Uh, and you can also see things that have both entered and exited in that same period of time. So uh, what about in the world of just information? Do you see the same uh, acceleration? And the answer is absolutely. A zettabyte is one trillion gigabytes. So the computer that you're using uh, to watch this presentation today, if it's a good, strong computer, it might have you know one to five uh, gigabytes. Imagine uh, one trillion gigabytes, and then look at the rate of change from let's say 2010 to 2020. And you know, in the coming year, the uh, global data sphere is expected to quadruple by uh, uh, 2025. So we see not only change, but we see accelerating change. And that means that change has become so rapid that ideas matter now more than they ever have before. So that's why we wanna talk about agile thinking and how we can improve upon that. And first of all, credit uh, for a lot of the ideas that follow are either amalgamations from or extrapolations from the ideas of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Leonard Moldenhoff. Uh, Daniel Kahneman was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, a terrific thinker. He wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which I highly recommend if you're looking for a, a reading list. Uh, and Leonard Moldenhoff uh, is a Bay Area physics professor, also wrote for Star Trek, and he wrote a fantastic book called uh, Elastic Thinking, Flexible Thinking in a Time of Change. And uh, credit to them for uh, uh, many of the ideas that we'll talk about, um, that we'll talk about today. We want to do two things today. I mean, first of all, we want to talk about how you develop agile thinking, and then we want to talk about how you avoid 
you know, being uh, in, in a thought pattern which is frozen and not, not agile. So first of all, let's take on that first task of, how, you know, what, what things can you think about or do and habits can you create to develop sort of agile thinking? And the first of those is to get in the habit of reimagining the thought frame. Right. And, and, and by this, what we mean is, you know, reimagine the mental image that you have when you're presented with a problem or a situation. We did that in the opening exercise. And now that we uh, have talked about the importance of reframing, let, let's try it again with, uh, with, with, with two more. Um, imagine a man is reading a book with the lights off in his library. Uh, and even though it's pitch black, the man is able to read. The book is not electronic format. How is that possible? And now a second one, imagine a magician claimed to throw a ping pong ball so that it would go a short distance, come to a stop, and reverse itself. And he added that it wouldn't bounce off any object, it wouldn't spin, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't tie anything to it, it would follow the, 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 the world and the laws of Newtonian physics. So how is that possible? I see a lot of great guesses in the chat box. And yes, 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 I see uh, we got this. Uh, right, the man is reading a book, it's because he's reading in Braille. And the second, don't see anyone who got that yet, but it's because of gravity. So imagine a mental image where you have someone laying on a bed, throwing a ping pong ball up. It uh, comes to rest naturally based on the pull of gravity and returns back uh, to, um, to the person's uh, hand who threw it. So again, you know, reimagining the thought frames means coming up with a different mental image than you were initially given uh, and initially you know, uh, served up to you uh, mentally and thinking about it in a, in, a, in a little different way. So so how can we do that? I mean, how can you reimagine the thought frames? Well, one thing you can do if you're working on a task and you're finding it difficult is add or subtract constraints to that task, right? Many of you may know the story about Dr. Seuss. You know, he really had writer's block and wasn't able to uh, come up with his next book. And then he had a brilliant editor who said to him, look, let's not try to write, you know, a, a book here. Let's try to write a story using 50 or less words. And so Green Eggs and Ham is the uh, output of that, uh, uh, of that constraint that was put on. You know, there's exactly 50 words. Here they are in uh, Green Eggs and Ham. And credit to his uh, editor for adding that constraint, which literally uh, kind of had uh, Dr. Seuss think about this in a different thought frame and a different uh, way of going about the uh, project. You know, uh, another thing you can do, you know, you reframe, you add and subtract constraints. A third way that you can reimagine thought frames is to just restructure the problem space, right? Think about uh, uh, the classic dog and bone problem where you have a dog on one side of a fence. There's a gate open behind the dog and the dog can see through, it's, let's say it's a chain link fence, and see through to a bone to the other side. Now, most dogs faced with this situation will immediately run over uh, right to the fence. They will classify physical distance as the problem space, that's their distance from the solution, right? And they will go right to it. Now the really sharp dog will try to do it will dig a hole or jump over it, but the incredible dog will actually redefine the problem space. They'll see the problem space as the distance from the solution, and they'll actually show a willingness to go away physically from the answer or from the goal in order to solve it and get closer to it. And this is what one thing that I would encourage you to do is when you're faced with a difficult problem, don't just jump into brainstorming the problem and coming up with ideas for, 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 to, to solve it. Instead, step back and ask yourself, how can I just reframe the problem space itself? How can I rethink about the problem itself? Another thing that, uh, that we do in our company that I think is uh, helpful uh, is to conduct a pre-mortem, right? Everyone's familiar with the idea of a post-mortem which is, you know, you implemented some project or some solution, maybe it didn't work out exactly as you planned, you do a post-mortem, you talk about the mistakes that were made, and you try to learn from those mistakes. When, when we talk about a pre-mortem, what, 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 what I mean is to try to prevent the mistakes from happening in the first place. So you get ready to make a decision, you bring the team together, you guys are all sort of coalescing around an answer, and then you say, okay, let's put ourselves in a position in the future six months from now, and it didn't go well, and let's ask the, the, the question, what, what could have gone wrong, right? It will reframe the thought process. It will get you out of that thought momentum of, of implementing something that uh, everybody seems to have uh, coalesced around. And it will help you uh, prevent uh, future mistakes. So you can reframe, you can restructure the problem space, uh, you can add and subtract constraints, you can conduct a pre-mortem. All these are great ways 
to reimagine the thought frame that you're working on, but perhaps the best thing that, uh, that you can do is bring other people into the process, right? And by this, I mean foster perspective diversity. And the quintessential book on this is called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Sirwicki. And the opening uh, you know, analogy or the opening story in the book uh, takes place in the 1906 Plymouth, Massachusetts Country Fair. And there are 800 people uh, in a crowd looking at a stage which had an ox, and those uh, folks are asked to estimate the weight of the ox. Well, it turns out that the you know, 800 people guessed, the average, the mean of all their guesses was 1,197. It turns out the actual weight of the ox was 1,198. And you might say, gosh, you know, that, that's amazingly, you know, uh, close, but it turns out it, it, it happens a lot, right? And, and why is that the case, right? It happens, it, it happens this way because in crowds that are in these guessing games, everyone's contributing the information that they possess. Now, many contribute valid information, right? So you have this large, valid informational pool. Now, some people, you know, contribute myths and mistakes, which is creates a large invalid pool. Now, those who are creating a valid pool, it might be a butcher who had specific knowledge. It might be someone who has an ox of the same size. There might be someone in the crowd who was there at the fair last year and had a approximate guess. But everyone's uh, contributing the, you know, the, 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 the specific information that they have uh, about that weight uh, of, uh, of the ox. And so all the valid informational points point in one direction while the errors have different sources and point in different directions and they cancel everyone out. And therefore what you get is you get a decision uh, in these situations where the wisdom of the crowd is greater than the average wisdom. It might not be uh, equal to or greater than the best guess among the people in the crowd, but it's definitely better than the average. Now, I do wanna say a caveat here, which is there is a criteria to have a wise crowd and most crowds are not wise. And, and, to, and what that means is that you have to have diversity of opinion, you have to have independence, decentralization, aggregation, and trust, right? So I don't want to uh, say you should make all your life decisions by going out and asking uh, 300 people what you should do. But in cases where you can bring in diversity of opinion and diversity of perspective, you will get better answers generally, as long as they're independent, decentralized, you have a way to aggregate them, and there's trust in the answer. Diversity opinion means that each person has to have private information, even if it's just an eccentric interpretation of an old facts. Independence means that people's opinions aren't determined by the opinions of those around them, right? Like if we give an answer in a chat box, you see everyone and there's an anchoring effect to the person who answers before, um, you know, they truly have to be independent decision makers. There has to be decentralization. You know, people have to be able to specialize and draw on their own local knowledge. And there has to be some way to aggregate, right? In this case, into a number, and uh, which, 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 which people uh, can trust. Um, so what are our takeaways from sort of reimagining uh, thought frames? This is the first thing we, that, that we want to accomplish to create agile thinking. You know, the first is that, you know, reframe mental images of problem spaces and brainstorm ways, um, you know, uh, brainstorm uh, ways to restructure problems before or you try to generate new ideas when you need a new insight. And the second is, you know, when at all possible, you know, perspective diversity improves idea generation, right? Have more people with different uh, viewpoints looking at the problem, you'll get a, uh, a more robust answer. Uh, so, so reimagine the thought frames. Um, secondly, um, think while you're not thinking. Uh, take time to, to, to be in the mental rest state. And um, this is hard to do today uh, where we have so many distractions, but let me um, sort of give you an example of why this is uh, so important. And uh, let me tell you a story about Mary, right? And uh, Mary was in 1816, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Godwin was in Switzerland for the summer and there was a downpour outside and she and her friends decided that they would gather by the fire and they would tell ghost stories and kind of try to scare each other. They did that. And then someone said, hey, look, let's have a competition to see you know, who can write, you know, their own story, kind of their own ghost or scary story or sci-fi story. And they all set about doing it. And all the friends came up with great stories that were fun and scary. And Mary just couldn't do it. She was racking her brain, but couldn't come up with that idea. She went to bed that night. They woke up the next day. They went um, uh, to, uh, to grab a bite to eat. Uh, they ate pasta. Then they went to a lecture on the science of the day, which 
uh, ironically, was about a Darwinian uh, exper experiment where uh, he supposedly had p uh, preserved a piece of pasta in a jar, and when electricity was added to it, it came to life. Uh, Mary thought that was interesting. She still couldn't think of an idea. Two more days passed. She couldn't think of an idea. They were getting ready to uh, to, 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 to leave, um, and then and she just said, that night I have to go to bed, and at 2 a.m., an idea came to her. And she wrote it down when she was in that twilight of sleep. And she wrote out, she wrote the outline for a story that now today has become the quintessential prototype for the science fiction novels. It's one of the best selling books of all time. And today we know Mary uh, by her married name, uh, Mary Shelley, and we know her book as Frankenstein. So the point of this story is that grit really matters. You know, sometimes when you're about to give up and you've been marinating on an idea and you just can't, you just can't, you know, make it, make it happen and deadlines are looming. Sometimes that's when the magic happens. That's when the good stuff happens, but you have to do that work of giving yourself, you know, time to marinate on it and giving really struggling with it and then let your associative brain when you're resting, kind of put the pieces together and, uh, and sometimes you get, you get served up an amazing, amazing idea. The, you know, a, a doctor who did amazing work in this space, an absolutely amazing woman, is Dr. Nancy Andreessen. And Dr. Andreessen was an amazing woman. She turned down a scholarship to Harvard because her father didn't believe that uh, women of the day should travel that far. She had to publish under a gender neutral name, NJC Andreessen. She became uh, the leading expert at PET scans. And for those of you who've ever had a PET scan, you know this is a positron emission tomography scan. And the research of the day that involved uh, PET scans, what they would generally do is they would give you a control task, right? And they would measure your uh, brain activity and they would see like if they gave you a, a, a math equation, like what parts of your brain would, would light up? Well, Dr. Andreessen was interested in the opposite. She was interested, what does your brain do at that rest state? And she called this random episodic silent thinking. So she left the PET scan on and she would let you do your task, but then when your mind went blank, she would measure what was happening in your brain. And it turned out to be an epiphany, not just for Dr. Andreessen, but for, for, for the scientific community. It turned out that there is a symphony in your idle mind, that that is when your brain is most busy. Uh, when you have a deliberate task that you're focused on, your brain activity actually diminishes. When you are uh, not thinking about you know, not thinking when you're thinking, you have a symphony going on in your idle mind. And that is when you have to, uh, that, that is when the associations happen and a lot of the good ideas uh, come. Maybe you've had the experience of you've been in a shower or you've been mowing your grass or you're driving to work, listening to music, and all of a sudden an answer to a problem that you were struggling with comes to you. Or maybe you're about to fall asleep or about to wake up and that's where that symphony of idle minds can make those associations and, uh, and the good, good, uh, fun, fun ideas can uh, flow. But what, what's, the, what's the enemy to this happening, right? The enemy to this happening is distractions. And I don't have to tell you that we live in a world where this is a big uh, thing to overcome, right? An average American interacts with their devices over six hours a day. Uh, an average American sends and receives 79 text messages per day. Uh, we send 121 emails per day, and we have eight calls per day. And when you have something, uh, you know, pinging you or reminders flashing or you're checking email, it's very hard to have that symphony of an idle mind happening. So what are our takeaways here for thinking while you're not thinking? Well, the first is start your projects early. Don't procrastinate. And even if you don't have all the answers, because just starting, just reading the questions, it'll allow you to marinate on it. It'll allow that rest state to work in your, uh, in your, in your, in your favor. Secondly, you know, uh, don't diminish the importance of breaks. Breaks really matter, right? Daydream a little bit, take a walk, exercise, clear your mind, allow that idle mind symphony to really happen. This is one of the amazing things about COVID, right? More people are taking walks, more people are getting outside and taking breaks. And that is, um, that's a good thing when it comes to uh, idea generation. And finally, avoid interruptions for some part of your day when you're trying to uh, come up with creative new ideas. I, I, you know, interruptions are literally idea killers. All right, so we talked about reimagining thought frames. We talked about thinking while you're not thinking and letting the rest state do its work. Next, we want to talk about lowering uh, remote filtering. So, uh, so that begs the question, like, what is remote filtering? Well, Let's just do a quick example. If I tell you the children made good snacks, 
an image something like this probably pops into your head because your head, you know, your mind mentally picked the uh, one of the more likely uh, images that the sentence could mean and that it associated with that image. If I told you uh, the cannibal said the children made good snacks, right, you'd have a much different picture in your head, right, something like this. If I ask you to read this, you know, and ask you, do you find this simple to read? Well, because of the phenomenal power of the human brain, most people do, you know, your associative brain and your remote filters can actually pick out the most likely uh, sentence that this, uh, that this makes, and most people can read this without a problem. How about if I ask you here, can you find the mistake here? All right, give me a few seconds, I'm looking at the chat box. Nope, nope, it's not the two, it's not the pattern of the colors, it's not that we left out a certain, right, right. Okay, it's the fact that the word the is repeated, is repeated twice, right? Can you find the, the mistake, right? It's, um, it's, it, it, it's an amazing thing that uh, the remote filters in our brain sort of filter out that is sometimes why it's hard to, uh, you know, check papers for grammatical errors, right? Um, here, here's an exercise I think that's fun uh, for re remote filtering. Uh, three words, crab, sauce, and tree, right? And, and the idea or the goal of this exercise is to pick one word, the same word that you could put at the beginning or the end of these three words, and it would make a compound word. All right, let me check the chat box again. Nope, no, 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 good guess, good guess. Yeah, yeah, there we go, someone got it, right. Apple, crab apple, apple sauce, apple tree. All right, let's do another fun one here. All right, this time a compound word. So not a single word, compound word. You could put the same word at the beginning or end of each of these three, and it would create a compound word. And yes, now, now we're getting good at it, right. Uh, band, band-aid, or van, bandwagon. So, uh, you know, what, what's happening in all these exercises, right? Well, what, what's happening is we have an unconscious perception system that is able to take in more information than our conscious awareness can process. And therefore, we have developed cognitive filters, right? So, another way to look at this is our visual perceptory system can process 10 billion bits per second, but our conscious brains can only really process and develop through about 40 to 60 bits per uh, second. So, you know, here's a fun exercise to show you um, this in a, in, in a different way. I'll, I'll pause and I want you to watch this video and count how many times the players wearing the white shirts pass the ball, just the white shirts. All right, so uh, I see a lot of answers in the chat box about the number of passes. Right, now the question for those of you who've never seen this before is how many of you saw the gorilla coming on the screen? Right, let me play it one more time for you so, uh, so, so, so you can see that. Yeah, I see some pretty amazed uh, comments in the, uh, in, the, in, in the chat box, right. So here you're just, your mind is busy focusing on the, the players in the white, you're disregarding uh, you know, the, the other players and you probably missed the fact that at this moment, the gorilla comes in, right? Now, for those of you who've seen it before, how many of you noticed that the background curtain's changing colors? Right, right. So, you know, we do tend to focus on whatever we're focused on, and we don't tend to uh, see the changes. So why, why does this happen? You know, it happens because mammals have prefrontal cortexes, and we have a frontal lobe, which is unique in mammals. And as part of, in that frontal lobe, we have an anterior cingulate cortex and it's short for ACC. And what it does is it serves as our uh, idea filter judge, right? And so it, it brings into our, our conscious awareness the most, um, the most commonly used things. Like when you're walking downstairs at, uh, at BC, you probably don't, when you're at the top of the stairs, think, well, how can I get down? Um, instead, you just put one foot in front of another. But imagine if you were a two-year-old and your ACC wasn't as developed, you might think I could fly down, I could do the, you know, jump on the railing down, I could get on my uh, backside and, uh, and slide down, and we don't think about those things. Instead, um, you know, uh, you know we, we filter those out and we put one step in front, one foot in front of the other and step down uh, the stairs. Uh, so, you know, 
let's imagine this the exercise of uh, if you're remodeling a bath uh, a bathroom right and you want to come up with some unique things well the obvious things that you would use supply wise to remodel the bathroom might be marble or granite or linoleum right and if you ask a you know a person who had very low remote filtering to give you other ideas of things you could use you know to uh, for the renovation they might say peppermint candy and newspapers which wouldn't be useful right but how do you get to that point where you get remote possibilities, you know, ideas that aren't obvious, but they are possibly useful, right? That's the goal. You know, like bamboo or rubber or recycled glass, depending on your uh, likes and dislikes. So, um, you know, that, that is the real goal is, you know, how can, we, how can we get to that point where we can make associations that matter and not filter out you know, everything, and on the other hand, uh, not be overwhelmed with uh, not be overwhelmed with choices. And let me let me tell you a story about Clarence Saunders. And th this is how all grocery stores looked um, in the early 1900s. Basically, notice that all the product is behind the shelf. And if you come in and you want a product, you you ask the 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 the, the clerk in the store to uh, grab that product for you. They grab it for you and then uh, ring you up. Well, Clarence Saunders, who was in the grocery business in the early 1900s, was on a train trip uh, and his train paused uh, by a farm. And he literally saw a picture that looked something like this. He saw a lot of piglets and they were basically self-serving themselves from uh, a trough. And he thought to himself, if the piglets can self-serve themselves, why can't you arrange a grocery uh, store where you brought out the product from behind the shelf. Like you put, you put the produce and the meats and the vegetables where other people could, people could get it themselves and then they would go to the front of the store where you could actually check them out. And that became sort of the prototype for the modern grocery store. And because Clarence Saunders, this idea uh, emanated from uh, his, uh, his trip where he saw uh, piglets, he named his grocery store Piggly Wiggly. And so this is the idea is to you know, make associations in whatever uh, industry and world and academic world that we're in that, 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 that matter, right? So how do we get better at, 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 at you know, remote filtering out less of uh, the, the, the good ideas? And so Simon, there was a Simon task that was done in 2015, and it looked at the effect of fatigue uh, you know, on this very question. And so in 2015, a research group proved that basically, if you exhaust your executive brain, you know, then it can actually improve your elastic thinking. So basically, they set uh, participants down in this test, and they asked them to punch the right or the left arrow keys based on where the middle arrow was. And they asked them to do this for 40 minutes. Now, some of those arrows were uh, you know, congruent with the other arrows, like in the left-hand example here. But some of them were not. They were facing in opposite directions, like in this incongruent example uh, on the right. And so for 40 minutes, you had to suppress the, the, the arrows that are, uh, you know, pointing in the wrong direction. And that exhausted uh, one's, you know, uh, executive brain. And then after this task was over, uh, they asked the participants to do a series of uh, innovative tests. They asked them to pull a household object together um, and they gave, they gave them this object and they said, come up with as many uh, ideas, alternative uses for this object as you, can, <clears throat> as you can imagine. And then they graded them both on the number that they came up with and the novelty. And what they found out was rather counterintuitive. What they found out was that the people who were tired from doing this uh, exercise, from doing the Simon task, actually came, were more elastic thinkers afterwards. They came up with more uses and more innovative uses. And then when they just had someone walk in the room and they asked them the question of, think of more uh, things that you can do with this everyday household object, uh, they came up with less and less innovative uh, ideas. So the, 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 the interesting takeaway here is fatigue is um, you know, counterintuitively helpful in idea generation. So if you're a morning person, maybe you want to do your creative activities at night, all right? If you're a uh, night person, maybe you want to do your creative activities in the morning and then do your, um, your fatiguing activities uh, at night. So think through that. Another thing that affects your ability to come up with ideas is mood, right? And, you know, mood, this goes back to, uh, you know, the, the, the early days of humans, right? If you see a uh, lion uh, in the grass, you would you know, be scared.
and it would trigger an autonomic response, right? <clears throat> so fear and anger and sadness and disgust, these elicit responses in our, uh, in our autonomic uh, nervous system. You know, maybe we sweat, we get an elevated heart rate, we vomit. And, you know, on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, what they do is they narrow your uh, negative emotions, they narrow your focus, right? You have a behavioral response and they narrow the scope of possibilities that you, you know, your cognitive filters allow through. Now, on the other hand, a positive mood does, does, does none of that, right? Gratitude, happiness, serenity, they produce no you know, autonomic response, right? So you actually, uh, you're not distracted to any behavioral response and thus, you know, your cognitive filters allow more in. So, um, so what are our takeaways um, from remote filtering? Well, the first is that grit truly matters, right? Remember Mary Shelley, right? When you're about to give up, that's when the good stuff can happen. Right. The second is learn your own filter calibration, your own predilection. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, a great example of this is, you know, those of us with uh, ADD, um, we have, you know, we, we let more ideas in generally. Right. So it might be attention deficit disorder, but it could be an idea uh, oasis. Right. And so you have to learn your own um, your own ACC, your own uh, remote filtering calibration and your own predilection. And then uh, think about you know, what time of day and when are you going to be most able to do your work, right? Maybe you want to tire yourself out with your math homework before you, uh, before you get on your creative writing paper uh, if you are indeed a, um, if you're indeed an early morning person. So, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, how, you know, these three techniques for how you generate more ideas, for how you generate more elastic thinking. What about the opposite, right? How do you avoid rigid thinking, uh, frozen thinking? How do you, how do you, how do you avoid that? Well, the first thing is to literally eschew functional fit, fix in this, right? And, uh, you know, what do we mean by this? If we were in person, we would do the following. We would give you a thumbtack, uh, have some of them here. We would give you a box of matches. Uh, like this, and we would give you a piece of cork board and, uh, and a candle. And we would ask you to figure out a way to attach the candle to the cork board and light it without catching the cork board uh, on fire. And typically what happens when we, when we ask people to do this is there's a real struggle. They try to pin the, 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 match in, the, the, the candle into the cork board and it's designed not to really uh, do very well. They try to light it um, you know, up above top and catch it on fire a little bit. But the only way to really achieve it is to do the following. And uh, if you can see this, it is to stop using the materials in the way that you're normally used to using them. And instead, take the thumbtack you know, in the bottom of the, uh, of, the, of the matchbox, connect the matchbox to the cork board, burn the bottom of the candle and put the candle uh, and use it and use the, uh, the matchbox as a candle holder. And so it looks uh, something, uh, something, something like that. Um, so it's due functional fix, fix in this. What, 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 what other things can we do? Well, you can avoid cogm uh, dogmatic cognition, right? So there was a JAMA study, a Journal of American Medical Association did a study where they looked at people who came into the emergency room with non-obvious, non-ordinary illnesses or sickness. Um, and they asked the question, based on who the person saw, if they saw a 20-year uh, uh, expert doctor or if they saw a first-year resident, who was likely to diagnose them correctly? Well, most of us, if we went to the doctor you know, with an illness that was unusual, would say we want the expert. Right. Well, it turns out that the first year resident uh, diagnosed more correctly the non obvious uh, diseases. So why is that? Right. It's because the 20 year expert has to fight through years and years of dogmatic cognition, years of experience. Right. Where most of the things they see are the flu. Most of the things they see are this or that. So for those non non obvious, non ordinary things, uh, a first year resident might be. Uh, might be actually more accurate. So what does that mean for us as we, as we think about this? I mean, what does that mean for, you know, how we approach, um, you know, our putting together teams, for example, for projects? Well, if you put together a team and you're attacking a given product, uh, uh, problem, of course you want the experts in the field on that, right? But you also, you want a non-expert. You know, you may want, you know, a student who's never thought about that idea. You may want a first year uh, who just joined your company. Uh, you'll want somebody who will bring a new perspective uh, to that, just like uh, the JAMA study uh, proved. A good way to do this, I think, is when you get around and you, you're having a meeting and you want to have a, 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 you know, a discussion about a, uh, an idea, let's say you're meeting in person like uh, pre-COVID or like we're doing now, 
one of the things I always encourage people to do is have a, a way to, dis, to capture your ideas pre-discussion, right? Because we've all seen this example where the CEO comes in, she gives her ideas, and then we all kind of defer to that authority figure, right? Or um, you're having a discussion and we're describing like how many things are, um, you know, some number and you have a very low number in mind, everybody else anchors at a high number and then you're, uh, there's idea momentum and you maybe, you know, defer to the group's wisdom. So writing ideas down pre-discussion, I think avoids that confirmation bias that we're all, you know, uh, susceptible to. And it also avoids authority deferral, which, you know, if unchecked can lead to uh, dogmatic uh, cognition. So uh, the, the next to last thing is less than intu intuition reliance, right? We all have a, a, a inflated view of our intuition uh, accuracy. Here's a quick example that you can do. A bat plus a ball cost $1.10, right? The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Okay, just put your answers <clears throat> uh, in the uh, chat box. Yeah, virtually everyone is answering right now 10 cents. Well, it turns out it's five cents, right? If you do the math, right? But, but, the, but this is what we commonly do with our intuition. If there's an answer that's hard, we substitute an easier question, right? And we, and, and we, and we, we don't necessarily uh, do the hard work. So your probabilistic intuition is probably not as great as you might think it is. And when ideas are important, you need to, you need to, you need to check those. Uh, you know, which of these two uh, arrows appears to, to, to be the longest? Right, there, there's almost unanimous consent in the chat box that it's the bottom. Well, it turns out they're exactly the same. This is the Mueller-Lyer uh, line length estimation, right? And so you have to teach yourself um, to really go beyond and really check what your intuition is telling you. Um, you know, there was a, uh, a, a, a study that was done um, uh, by uh, Kahneman and Tversky, where they rigged a Wheel of Fortune game uh, to only stop on 10 and 65, right? And so a uh, participant would, would spin the wheel, it would stop at a 10 or 65, and then they would pull the participant aside and they would ask them, what is the percentage um, of the UN that's made up by, of African nations? And, you know, and by the way, the, an the, the actual answer is 28%. Well, it turns out that those who spun on a 10 on average, guess 25%, right? It turns out that those who guess 65, on average, guess 45%, right? So, I mean, even though the participants realized that it was incredibly uh, chance on, you know, they, they had no idea that the game was rigged, that there was chance on which it had landed, and that it had no basis for the question that was being asked, nevertheless, the, the, they were influenced by this uh, anchoring effect. So all this to say, you know, when things are important, lessen your intuition reliance. And um, the last thing to avoid rigid thinking is create a capture mechanism, right? Everyone here on the Zoom call has a world-class idea, guaranteed, right? Most just go unbottled or uncaptured, and you have to develop a way where you can write it down. You know, a notebook, a app which records your, your ideas, some way where you can capture your ideas and you can build upon them. Uh, Sarah Blakely, uh, the founder of Spanx, you may know her from Shark Tank, says every time she has an idea, she writes it down right then. And the more she writes down, the stronger that connection becomes with her idea. And she starts getting uh, more and more ideas around it. So have a capture mechanism, right? Don't let your great ideas go unchecked. I mean, every one of you is an amazing anomaly, right? You're going through a life path that no one has gone through before in the history of humankind, right? Your experiences are unique. Now you're having some experiences that I've had and some experiences that I've others had, but many of your experiences are unique to you. And that means you're able to make associations that no one else can make, right? So, 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 so capture those ideas and write them down and you'll be surprised at how your connection to them grows. A, a, a great example of this is Virginia Apgar. Uh, you know, she delivered babies for, you know, most of her career and a young resident actually asked her at a table, you know, how would she would go ab about, you know, assessing the health of a newborn and she got out a napkin and she created a real simple matrix, right, where she put like color and whether or not they were crying and, and three other metrics on the left and then she had grades like zero, one and two on the top. So if the color was pink, you know, she would give it a, a one score. If the color was blue, she would give it the opposite. Somewhere in between, she'd give it a one. And she said, look, I do this right after a baby is born, and then I do it a few minutes later, and I average them, and that's kind of, you know, how I tell the health of a newborn. Well, 
that simple idea written down on a napkin uh, has now become the APGAR score, right? And for any of you who've had kids, you know that they look at the appearance and the pulse and the grimace and the activity. They score them one to two. They do it twice. And this is our quintessential delivery room, uh, you know, health um, uh, way we judge uh, health of a newborn today. So capture those great ideas. All right, so how do we wrap all this up? I mean, when you need a new idea, what should you do, right? Well, the first thing is start early, right? Uh, let yourself marinate, you know, let the, the, uh, the symphony of an idle mind, you know, that Dr. Andreessen talked about work. Um, minim minimize disruptions. Remember we talked about how often your phone rings, how often things ding, uh, and try your best to minimize those and give your mind a chance to make the associations that it's so good at making. Insist on perspective diversity. Remember the wisdom of the crowds and James uh, Sirwicki that when you have multiple people looking at an issue, you're likely to get uh, a, better, a better answer. Um, when you have a tough problem, try to restructure it before you even brainstorm solutions. Remember the dog and the bone uh, problem. Uh, monitor your fatigue and mood. Remember the counterintuitive uh, results of some of the, the, some of the studies where when you're fatigued, you actually, uh, you actually come up with uh, more uh, remote ideas. And uh, remember, when you're happy, you're more likely to be open to uh, more ideas than when you're uh, fighting some autonomic response from uh, fear or being scared or something like that. Uh, take breaks. Remember, walking, uh, getting outside, uh, doing something different, uh, vegging for a while, taking a bike ride. These things uh, are good. They change your perspective. They change ideas. Uh, foster dissent. You know, talking to people who have different views than your views uh, does uh, keep you open to uh, elastic thinking. Include non-experts on teams. Remember the JAMA study, right? That you're more likely to get diagnosed correctly by a first year than a 20 year expert. And uh, so when you're assembling teams to go attack problems, I mean, put some people on the team who have never thought about, thought about the problem. And you might be surprised at the perspective that, uh, that they bring. Cast your ideas before the discussion starts. If you're about to have a important discussion, literally, you know, give everybody a, a, a sticky notepad and have them write their ideas down before uh, the CEO gives uh, her opinion, right? So you don't have any deferral to uh, authority. And uh, verify on important issues your probabilistic intuition, right? Remember, I mean, you know, it, it, it may not be, remember the bat and the ball problem and that it might not be as accurate as, as you and I give ourselves uh, credit for being when it comes to our intuition. And finally, and most importantly, you know, when you're frustrated, don't quit, right? Have grit, keep going, keep marinating on ideas. Remember Mary Shelley, because that's when the great, great stuff uh, can happen. So uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me today. And thank you for uh, letting me uh, be a part of this uh, with you and good luck uh, in your uh, Leadership Academy. I know you guys are going to uh, go on and do uh, great things. Uh, before I pause and we send everyone to breakout rooms, I wanted to uh, give you a few exercises. And I understand um, that what we're going to do is divide people into uh, groups of about, um, about 15 apiece. And there's three exercises. The first is, is very simple. Work in any way you deem most important as a group to answer the following. Uh, how many rubber bands does the package shown to the right contain? And note, this is the same package shown from two different angles. So just one guess is uh, all you need. Again, you can work in any way you deem most, in, uh, most effective to answer this in your Zoom breakout room. The second is work as a group without any searches or research, no Googling or the like to answer how many piano tuners are there in Chicago. And again, a piano tuner is a person who goes around and uh, tunes pianos, okay? It's not an instrument. And third, uh, Draw a three dot by three dot matrix uh, on a piece of paper uh, or on the computer screen in your breakout room and connect all nine dots using four straight lines. The next line has to begin where the previous line ends. So don't pick up your, um, don't pick up your pencil. All right, uh, with that, we're gonna divide you into Zoom groups. Thanks again for uh, having me here today. And uh, I, um, I, I look forward to uh, seeing uh, all the great things that, uh, that uh, each of you is gonna do. Thank you again.